me and my technological issues. Uh, let's everyone stand, go to the Lord in prayer. God is speaking, and I think the question today is, are we listening? We're going to talk about that. Lord Jesus, I thank you for your power. I thank you for your supernatural moving in the earth. I thank you, O oh God, that we are tapped into, connected to, plugged into the creator of the universe and the maintainer of all that's stable in the earth today. God, with the chaos around us, we once again reach our hands toward you and ask you for help and let, let you know once again that we are dependent upon you. Every breath we breathe comes from you. Our very life and our essence comes from you. And Lord Jesus, guide us, direct us, and lead us. We need you. We want you. We invite you into our lives once again today. And everyone said in Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Um, I will just have to say, and I, we will mention it again in our main service, but I have a special guest here today, my cousin, Steve Rory. Uh, he is from Indiana, and he is, yes, he's uh, come to New Orleans on business, and he's going to stay over, and we're going to have church together today. Uh, Brother Rob is going to be uh, preaching for us today, which is really good. I think Yolanda's going to be uh, leading in worship some today, so that'll be really nice. So we're just having a kind of a sort of family reunion, some fried chicken and, you know, all that good stuff. Anyway, I'm thrilled to have you today. Thrilled to have you today. Um, I have had a, an interesting journey. I turned 60 in February, and I really thought about uh, the fact that I was 60. It, it, you know, it really didn't feel any different so much. But that 60 word just, <laughs> you know, just hangs there. And you know, and you 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 don't mean to, but things you think about, you refer back to that number. And I don't know, just somewhere in my thinking and rambling around in my brain, <clears throat> I've, I've just kind of come to this uh, beautiful pause in that pendulum swing. And it is that I genuinely want to hear the voice of God for this season of my life. I feel you do. I feel that God has a particular plan and purpose for every season of our life. I don't think any season is wasted. We often look back at some of the stupid things we did and the silly things we said, and we do not want the curtain to be pulled back today. Uh, <clears throat> God bless. Uh, we had a shower yesterday, and one of our young men that's about to be a dad, his mother had placed his picture, a real big picture of him, with just his underwear and a little fishing pole. Don't you love it? Don't you love it? But ever, those seasons you think that are wasted, you look back and realize that God guided. And without him, sometimes he had to hijack my plans. Sometimes he had to come down and speak rather roughly to me. But I thank God that he's directed me to this day. But I don't want to get to this season of my life and feel, you know, Really, I've kind of been there, done that, and I want to hear a fresh word from God for my life. And I'm going to be speaking uh, for the next possibly two weeks. I don't think I'll get finished today, as usual. Thank God for teaching. Um, <clears throat> but I'm going to be speaking on spiritual intuition, listening to the voice of God. The word intuition means the ability to hear or sense something that is not readily evident to know something without deducing that from knowledge or reasoning. Spiritual intuition in the Bible is called a word discernment. 1 Corinthians 2.13, These things we also speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual with spiritual. But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolish to him, how many of you have ever had felt that God was directing you or speaking something to you, and you thought, "Oh, that's stupid." Oh, surely, surely that that no, no, that can't be you, God. 
nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. Spiritual discerning helps us to recognize what is of God and what is not. Spiritual discerning allows us to draw conclusions based on God's perspective. It also assists us to make wise decisions in difficult circumstances. Many times in my life, I have really wanted to do something extremely bad. And I can't tell you how difficult it is to hear the voice of God in those times. Because everything I look at, everything I hear points to exactly what I want to do. I'm going to tell you, that's got to be the hardest. When you don't know what to do, those times are the easiest. Because you really don't have a plan. And every road looks like a detour. And every other place you go seems like a cliff. And so you're looking for God to send the Navy SEALs to come in and swoop you out. And you know, anything is, is, is good. Anything's attractive. But... Spiritual discerning is so important in every season of our lives because I have, too, in seasons, wanted to do something so desperately. I saw it written on the, on the wall. I saw it, oh, I saw a sign, or oh, somebody said, and it's everything I'm wanting to hear, and then I find myself being uh, sidetracked on the road somewhere with a flat tire and begging God to deliver me. It is so amazing. Uh, bloodhounds have the ability to, to, to smell, uh, I don't know, a million scents, but, but all kinds of scents. And it is amazing that they have the, whatever that is, to be able to block out every scent except the one scent that the owner or maybe it's the policeman or whatever gives them the clothes of a lost child and so they... Yeah, Brother Chase, that's, I'm talking about you. And they give him the, uh, the little clothes. And, and this bloodhound has the uncanny ability to block out everything else it smells and to only hone in on that. Oh, God, that I could be like that. Oh, God, that I could turn down the noise and I could get rid of my own selfish ambitions or my, maybe my own desires and motives. And, and, Lord, just hear you and then hone in on that and then follow through with that. What a beautiful thing that is. Our ears are amazing. Not only do they hear, but they differentiate between types of noises. For example, if you were to spend the night with me, you would probably tell me the next morning that my grandfather clock kept you up all night. But I don't even hear that grandfather clock. The only time I hear it is in the middle of the night if I wake up and I'm listening to know what time it is. Maybe my clock is blinking because of a million times our electricity goes off in this community. And uh, I'm thinking, what time is it? And then I hear it. Uh, a baby's cry. I'm telling you, my husband could sleep through screaming kids. I used to think, oh, God, help him to hear that child just this one time and go in there. No way. He just slept right on through. But my ears, that mother's ears are tuned. And I'll tell you something. There could be five babies crying in here, and that mother knows the sound of her child. Uh, I've, I've told you all this story, but it bears just mentioning again. Uh, I was in the middle of the sleep, and I was by myself. I don't know where Rick was, but uh, anyway, I was there in that big house by myself, and so I'm sleeping so soundly, which I love to do. I do it well, and suddenly I hear this sound that wakes me up, and it was this little, and I'm going, oh my God, somebody's trying to got a, they're they're trying to pick the lock on the door, you know, and I've got all these million uh, catastrophes that kind of come to my mind and and as I got more awake I realized it was coming from my left of the bed so I'm thinking oh surely someone's not under the bed you know I it's just stupid why do you do that you just don't have any sense when you wake up like that and I found out it was a little mouse in the trash can well that was as bad as, as bad as the person trying to break in for me I'm like, oh, God, what am I going to do if I go to sleep? I promise you, if you go to sleep with a, with a spider on your 
uh, ceiling, it will be in the bed with you sometime during that night. That has happened to me before. You might as well get up and do something about the spider on the ceiling. Well, I knew if I went to sleep, I would have the mouse in the bed, so I had to do something and nobody was there. And so uh, I don't remember exactly what I did, but I think I picked up the trash can and I put it out on the porch. That seemed to be the safest. A mechanic can be riding along in a car and, and, or a truck and it's making all these kind of redneck noises that we have around here, you know. They're making all these uh, rackets and, and the whole vehicle shaking. But you let that faint tapping that isn't normal, a mechanic can pick it up. Our ears are amazing. Oh, God, that we could really have that kind of sensitivity to the Spirit. I want that. I desire that. I think the question is, do we really believe that God wants us to hear that keenly? And then the second question is, are we willing to shut out the other voices and the noise to hear his voice? Our ears and our brains work together to determine whether it is safe or it's to cause alarm. So spiritual hearing works much the same way. The word promises us on several occasions that Jesus is always speaking. Um, If you look at the book of Revelation, when it talks about the first three chapters, it talks about the church age, and it talks about how that Jesus is speaking to the church. He that has an ear, let him hear. That's speaking of the church age or our age. And he has a now word. He is never, I I love it, when uh, you... When you see, we had a young man receive the Holy Holy Ghost a few weeks ago, and and I couldn't st- uh, help but stand there, and I am seeing this young man. He is just crying and he's speaking in a supernatural language, and I couldn't help but go back to the first uh, outpouring in the Book of Acts and think, he's not getting a second or third or fiftieth generation Holy Ghost. He's receiving the same Spirit that Mary, the mother of Jesus, received in Acts two. I mean, when, he, when God speaks, he speaks to my now situation. He's very current. And what's really, really awesome is he's futuristic. I don't know my future. I don't know how this is going to work out. But I'm going to tell you many times I've stepped out on a promise. And you know what? I, I've learned I can trust his promises. Uh, there are so many voices Are we turning down the noise and the static and fine-tuning into his frequency? There is so much noise, and yes, it's even in the church. We have ideas, we have agendas, we have busyness, we have some posturing, yes, I'm sure, some dividing, yes, I'm sure, some promoting, yes, I'm sure. And oftentimes we can get so caught up in just the life of the busyness of the body of the church that we forget that really the voice of God for my life is my most important thing. Um, I had um, an experience. I was going on my husband when he had convinced me a couple years ago to go on vacation. Once again, I should not have listened, but I cannot tell him no. He convinced me you and I can go by ourselves to the mountains and I'll help you. And he meant it with every word, but I knew better, but I did it. Thank God Stephen is with us now, and he's with my husband. He's preaching in Faraday this weekend, and I am thankful Stephen is with him. He is better at that than I am. Well, anyway, here we are. We stop at uh, Chattanooga in a beautiful, uh, there's a particular hotel we love to stay at because there's really nice shopping and restaurants for his, that's his taste, his restaurants around there. So he always looks forward to that. So we get there, and and sure enough, it is hot. It was in the middle of July, and it was hot. And so uh, here I am, you know, he's trying to help me, and the poor thing is sweating down. And I said, you know, just let me get you in the room. And so we got everything unloaded finally, and we were, you know, everything. Then we started talking about eating. And uh, so we went out to eat that night and got up the next morning, and um, it was time to pack. And he's trying to help me, and I said, you know, you, it's, it's in his heart. It's in his heart. It's just not, you know, the body won't cooperate. So I finally talked him into sitting in, in the breakfast area. So he's sitting down there, you know, and uh, waiting on me. Well, I, he had helped me pack up everything, so I bring it down four, four, fourth floor, 
off the elevator, out the side door, and it's one of those doors, not an automatic door. I don't know why they had that here at this hotel, but the handicap is around back where you have to have a key to get in and out of the door. Well, I push my loaded down buggy out there to my little car, and so I get ready to, to start unloading, and I'm looking for my keys, and I can't find my keys. I am in a mess. Well, I think, oh, well, that I must have, uh, you know, you go through all the, I must have left them in the car. I must have, no, I didn't. Then I go, oh, well, I need to go back up to the room. So I did. Then I dug through my purse. I couldn't find it. And I hated to tell him. I finally did. I said, after about 30, 45 minutes, I said, I'm sorry. He said, what in the world's going on? I said, I can't find my keys. He said, well, you probably left them in the room. So I get the maids and everybody digging. We was digging under beds. We pulled back covers. We was letting no keys anywhere. And so this went on for probably two hours. I finally uh, brought the buggy back up with all the luggage, and I started to unload everything. And I remembered a voice. Brother Barnes, I had had an interview with him a few months before, and y'all know him's a great prophet of God, and he was an elder prophet in our life. So I had, we had preached for him one weekend, so um, I had taken that opportunity to interview him. And one of the things I'd asked him about was hearing the voice of God. And he said, well, God's always speaking, and he's always speaking about our life if we will be still and really listen. you got to tune out everything else. He said, because usually when you're needing to hear the voice of God, you are so hyped up. Your brain is going a million miles. God, you just can't tune in. I mean, he is speaking. So I, those words came to me. I sat down in a chair, and I'm just sweated down, and I'm just in a frenzy because you cannot, the type of key I have, you cannot go buy it anywhere. You have to order it. And I didn't know, I mean, it just, we would have been, I don't know what we would have happened. But anyway, it was, I thought of a million bad scenarios. None of them were good. So I'm sitting there, and I remembered his voice. So I sat there for a minute, and I breathed. And I breathed in, and I breathed out. And I said, Lord, you know the plan for my life. You know where I am right now. And I just kind of began to talk to the Lord about how good he was to me and how he had always been there. And, you know, just thinking about some situations where he would got me out of binds. A million things I've lost. I am so scatterbrained. God has helped me. He has a very busy angels helping me find things. I can tell you that. And as I was sitting there, I looked across at my computer bag. Because I was convinced that coming in that door with that key lock, there's a garbage can right there. And I was convinced that my keys had somehow fell in that garbage and was gone. And I looked up, and in the corner of my computer bag, I had this little, uh, my keys are on this little thing that hangs over your purse so I don't lose them. And so I see it in the corner of my computer bag. I didn't put it there. It had somehow in all the confusion dropped and just so happened to hang on the side which is another miracle I looked and there are my keys and I kid you not that very day it was as though I heard I didn't hear an audible voice but it spoke so deep in my spirit and God said I will when it's time to turn I will tell you when to turn I'll be there until I speak don't worry about it just keep going forward and when it's time to turn, I will give you a signal. And if you're listening, I will speak to you and I will tell you which way to turn. I can't tell you what a comfort that's been to me in my life. I went downstairs and I told Rick, you know, the keys are found. He's like, oh, you idiot. How could you do that? And I'm like, you know I was an idiot when you married me because I was always losing stuff then. And, and um, you know, we got past that. And I told him, I said, you know, I think God just taught me one of the most beautiful lessons for my future that I will ever learn, and it was kind of painful. But anyway, probably one of our greatest gifts will be to learn to hear the voice of God above the chaos, that quiet voice in the midst of great noise. The question today is, are we willing to block out the noise around us, and that's the most difficult. 
I want to hear him now. It is so easy to get on autopilot. I think I've realized that. You know, you flow through the months and days, and, you know, you just, I know he's with me, and, you know, well. And I, I want Jesus to know, though, however, today that I've got my ear pressed against his heart. I, I just feel this renewed sense that somehow he's wanting to reveal some new things to us. I want to wait to hear his voice and his instruction for my today and tomorrow. Saul started out, and he started out really good. He was, you know, as the least, if you remember, he hid behind the stuff when he was crowned king. He was going to be crowned king. Uh, The prophet Samuel had already anointed him, and he's hiding because he was so humble. But this man, through time and success, his heart was lifted up, and suddenly he didn't need Samuel anymore, and he really didn't need God anymore. He didn't need the prophet's directions because he really... Felt like he had it. And his end did not happen very well. King Hezekiah, he did so great. But as he aged, one thing was said about him that in the end he got careless and he started making decisions on his own merit. And this was very displeasing to God. I don't think God is a control freak. I think that he really, if we love him and we respect that he has higher thoughts, it's just the fact that through seeking his counsel, is one of the greatest ways we can worship his deep deity. If we really feel that his knowledge is higher, then we will take the time and we will wait and do whatever it takes to hear from him. Solomon started out so good, didn't he? He had such a sterling and sincere and seeking prayer. One of the most beautiful <clears throat> prayers that's ever been prayed where God in response says, you didn't pray for riches or fame, but I'm going to give that to you. And then the beautiful prayer at the dedication of the temple where the glory of God came down and just blessed them and filled them. But one of the saddest scriptures in the Bible to me, I just wish it wasn't in there, but, but it is. And, you know, I don't want it to be said about my life. First Kings 11 and 4, for it was so that when Solomon was old, not that I'm old, but, you know, older, that his wives turned his heart after other gods, and his heart was not loyal to the Lord his God, as was the heart of his father David. David had a way. He says, I can't do it without you, God. And then he says, uh, when he's standing before Saul and Goliath is screaming and cursing and blaspheming, he said, the God who was with me to slay the lion and the bear is going to help me today, and I am going to slay that blasphemer today. And we know of his mistakes that he made, but I love the fact that when he made mistakes and he was confronted with those mistakes, you know what he would do? He would humble himself once again and say, God, I can't make it without you. I listened to a song all this morning. I just had to keep repeating that I I can't make it without you. I've looked looked at high and low. There is nobody greater than you. Nobody greater than you. And and, uh, David just had this way about him. He could find his way back to that place in God, where he could hear from him once again. He was quick to fall at the feet of the Almighty. He was quick to pour out his need. If you read his Psalms, you will see his constant and ever perpetual verbalizing of the need he had of God in his direction. He had such a keen pers- perception that Almighty God had superior counsel. Psalm 16, 7, I will bless the Lord who has given me counsel. My heart also instructs me in night seasons. When you're going through, can't go to sleep at night, going through a million things that you can't handle, don't know what to do with, and could go wrong, could go wrong, don't know what. Uh, my daughter was talking to me yesterday about Jude. Suddenly he's wanting to now look like punk rockers. And so she is freaking out. And she's like, how in the world does a 10-year-old know how to do that? Well, even think about that. She said, I try to be careful about everything, their media and everything. And, you know, she said, I don't know what to do. I said, you plead the blood. When it was your age, it was Metallica. She had Metallica all over the edge. She had Kurt Cobain and the guy had committed suicide now. She, had, she didn't have basketball players or, or movie stars. No, she, you know, she, that girl, she was something. In fact, she said, oh, Mom, I, kn- I know what you went through now. Why, my stomach's hurting and I don't know what to do. You plead the blood. That's what you do. You plead the blood. He made many mistakes along the way, but, 
you know, he knew who was his counselor. Psalms 33 and 11, the counsel of the Lord stands forever. The plans of his heart to all generations. Psalm 70 through 24. You will guide me with your counsel and afterward receive me to glory. He wanted to make sure that God knew that he wanted his plan until he said goodbye to this world. David often sang or wrote songs to remind Israel and himself, don't make the mistakes of our forefathers. I think he was reminding himself as much as us today. Psalms 81, 11, but my people would not heed my voice, the Lord said, and Israel would have none of me. So I have given them over to their stubborn heart to walk in their own counsel. Oh, that my people would listen to me, that Israel would walk in my ways. Um, I, I can't help but think of the song, uh, I did it my way, and it was um, sang by a very famous artist way before the time of Elvis Presley. But Elvis Presley also sang that song, and both of those who recorded that song and made it so popular actually did things their way. And I think, if anything, it is a beautiful lesson to look if that's what the end looks like when you did it your way. Now, Elvis however, would in every concert make sure that he gave a token nod to his Christian background. And he would sing a beautiful song. He even did a complete uh, recording of the gospel songs of his favorites. And that was really nice. But today, I don't want to give a nod at Jesus. I don't want to give this little token, you know, I have a little respect and then move my own direction and do my own thing and make my own decisions. You know what God's looking for? Maybe we can do a token nod at the knowledge of man, but devote our life to seeking the knowledge of our Jesus Christ. Thank you, Jesus. Psalms 106, 11 through 13. The waters covered their enemies. There was not one of them left. They believed his word. They sang his praise. They soon forgot his work, and they did not wait for his counsel. So how do we seek his counsel today? I've got five things I'm going to go through quickly. Number one, we must truly believe in our heart that Jesus Christ has the best answers. (laughs) And sometimes I really like my answers better. Do we truly believe that? Do we truly believe that? Isaiah 55 and 8, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor your, my ways your ways. For as high as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts. I can tell you I've had seasons where I've actually felt, Thank you, Lord, for getting me this far. Now I've got this. I didn't say it, but I just didn't feel this urging need to get, you know, I just wanted the Lord to bless my plans. I tell you, it don't take very long. You get out there very far in, in, the, in the desert till you realize I need some water. And if I don't get a miracle, I'm going to die out here. I've had seasons of that, I can tell you. Uh, the second thing is to seek him and seek his word through meditation, through study and prayer. And I really want to emphasize to you, I think it's important to keep a record of your prophecies. We are a church that practices the gifts of the Spirit. We have incredible people in our pastoral team, uh, not just our pastoral team, but uh, men and women among us who have the gift of prophecy. Take those seriously. Write those down. I've got a book at home where I go and write those. In fact, I have actually had to stop people and say, wait a minute, let me get my pen. I need to write that. Because I go home and I put it in a book. When I am studying and I am in a time when I am seeking God, I will take out that blue book. And I go back and I start looking and I start seeing. You said this, you said this, you said this, you said this. You will be amazed at the things that God said that you're already living in. And then you're seeing, wait, he's already projecting my tomorrow. So you know what? Today might seem like everything's upside down and the world's coming to an end and this is going to be the last chance and the last day of my life. But you know what? I am hinged to a promise that's bigger than my today. And God's going to carry me through one way or the other. Study and pray about those. Seek godly wisdom from spiritual authorities in your life. And you know what? I don't usually just seek one. I know I was, uh, I think I mentioned to you this a few weeks ago. I texted Brother Robert Tisdale the other day. He had given me a prophecy the last time he was here. 
I'm anxious to hear him again. I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm anxious for him to come again. But uh, I said, Brother Tisdale, you said this, you said this prophecy to me. Now, could you tell me, uh, do you remember anymore? Was there a specific, you know, feeling or whatever? Now, this has been at least a year ago. And he said, well, you'll have to let me pray and see if I can get back in that channel. And I'll text you back if I feel some more things about that, which he did, and he did get back to me, and it was so incredible. And I'm like, oh, my God, because I'm telling you, you can hold on to the Word of God. And what happened, it confirmed things that were prophesied to me by some of you or things I had felt in prayer or something I had read in the Word, and it all comes together. And you know what? You can stand on that. You can build your house on that. That's what's called building on the rock. People can build on all kinds of things that you build on the economy. I'm telling you, it's a foundation of sand. You build on the wisdom of the latest and the greatest writers of philosophy or even church growth. You know what? It doesn't take but five or ten years and there's some new idea. And all those ideas are down the toilet, most of them. You know, got to have the latest and the greatest. You know what the latest and the greatest is? It's the voice of Jesus Christ speaking into my life. It's hearing the word of God. It's hearing a prophet say, thus saith the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And the third thing is to steal the noise. Find that quiet place and think. And then the fourth thing, and this is probably my hardest right here, is to wait. 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 And wait. You know, just keep waiting until. That's just hard for me. But then, the fifth, we still have to be willing to obey. And it seems like always when God finally speaks or you finally get tuned in to hear what he's saying, you have to take risk. There's stuff you don't like. There's something you have to crucify. There is always a... You know, I I really do want to hear the voice of God today. I want to hear the voice of God today. But I tell you what, sometimes what I'm really saying is, God, I want you to write it on the wall like you did in, in Daniel's day. Write it on the wall. Or I say, Lord, I want you to be like like Gideon. Gideon's just working, you know, and he's hiding out by night, and he, you know, scared somebody's going to catch him. And, you know, he's in this very fearful. They're in bondage, and they are you know, have nothing but negativity. They are in, in a desperate and dark time in history. So here he is, and he is stuck in the middle of this mess, and he does not know what to do. And, and so here he is in this condition. And he's hiding, and he's got knots in his stomach, and he's probably got a headache, and he's probably got heart problems and everything else because this is how he's eking out food for the next day for his family. And suddenly an angel appears and said, Oh, Gideon, the mighty man of valor. That's what I want the Lord to do to me. I want him to just say, Donna, you great woman of God, this is what you're going to do. However, what he told Gideon to do was, I want you to go destroy the idols and all these groves that your dad has put up everywhere. Well, that was not good. That was not good because guess what? The people loved him. And the townspeople worshipped him. And his daddy had built them. So guess what he did? Well, I'll go do it at night. So he gets a couple compadres and they go at night and do it so nobody will know they did it. But by the next day, they did know who did it. And he was in a very bad situation. However, when the townspeople came together and said, we want to, it's your son that did it, it's Gideon that destroyed him, and we're going to kill him, we're going to take his life, the dad stood up and said, wait a minute, let the idol gods defend themselves. Huh. I mean, if they were God, they would have defended themselves. How come? If they have so much power, my son was able to destroy them. So God always steps in, doesn't he? Thank God. We'd be in trouble. Or I want it to be like, you know, I want it to be like, uh, uh, you, know, the, you know, Daniel, the voice comes and, you know, the angel comes and, and, and touches him and he falls out like one dead. You know, he faints. And that, that's what I want. That's what I want the Lord to do. However, it's often a lot like it was with Peter. And I, I'm always, you know, running out of time here. But this is where we are. 
And the crux of what I'm really saying today, I think, is, is played out in the life of Peter in a storm. Now, Apostle Paul was in a storm, and I often wondered how in the world he heard the voice of God amid all of that storm and the creaking of that ship and the screaming of the people. But somehow he found a place that he could hear the voice of God in himself. So here Peter is, and so he's like a, a, the ghost, you know, is coming on the water. And so he's like, oh, we're dying. We're going to die out here, you know. We're trying to obey the voice of God, and we can't get back to the shore. We're stuck out here in the middle. Anybody ever been there? Trying to do the will of God, you know. And it says, oh, God, there's a ghost, and we're going to all die. This is the conclusion, you know. This is good. We're going down. If we don't go down in the ship, you know, the ghost is coming. It's probably the death angel, you know, and just really, really exa- exaggerating the situation. And suddenly the ghost speaks and says, don't be afraid. It is I. And Peter's like talking to this ghost. If it's you, Jesus, bid, bid me come. And the Lord said, come. And we are often like, what? Huh? I, I don't know if I'm hearing you correctly. I don't know. Is that really you? Now, thank God what Peter did is what we want to do. Peter steps out on a risk, a huge risk. We love to think that he stepped out on smooth waters. I don't know if it would help my feelings at all because I'm definitely afraid of water, always have been. almost drowned my swimming instructor, and she fired me. She fired me. I didn't fire her. She fired me. I almost drowned her. I was an adult. But anyway, even if it was smooth, I don't think I'd have stepped out there. But do you think about the reality? Really, really. Peter steps out on a rocking water, shifting every which direction. And he begins to walk on the word of God. However, the Bible says when he looked around and saw the winds and the waves, and he realized, I'm an idiot. What was I thinking? You can't walk on the water. And he began to drown, as we often do. And thank the Lord, the Lord took him in his arms. And I don't know, I've heard many stories, but the Bible doesn't really say We've heard, you know, they walk together back to the boat. And if that were me, I would say, Lord, you can just carry me from here. I mean, really, I, I don't know that I'd have been the one walking. I've heard that he carried him. I don't know what happened. All I know is Jesus and Peter got back to the boat. And when he got in the boat, then he said, peace be still. You know what my desire is? For there to be peace before God is finished with the work in my life. And if I'm waiting for there to be a peaceful time to hear the voice of God, I've missed the best opportunities to obey his voice. Today in your life, many of you are in uh, different seasons. Um, Many of you are in places that even if there's a whole lot of things where you've checked the boxes and things are going exactly like you want them, there are areas. It's like you can never get everything fixed all at one time. Just as you think one thing is in balance, something else unravels. And if, especially if you have family, now if you're a hermit, maybe that, but y'all, I guess, wouldn't be here if you were hermits. But if you're around people, if you are actually working jobs, if you're, if you, if you're living the American dream today, then you have issues that, you really cannot, in your own ability, make the best decision. But I've come to tell you today that he still has the answers for your life. And I love the fact in Psalms 139, he says, and he has formed you in your mother's womb, and he knows you, and it goes on to say, and even he has set in order the number of your days. He knows what your end is going to be. He has determined the days of your life. So you know what? Today I just feel to end with this wonderful prayer. I, all that I am is so inferior to your glorious and wonderful knowledge. What I am and what I have left, maybe I only have a day left, maybe I only have a week left, but I kind of feel like I might hang around a while. And you know what? There's just a lot of things that I, I, don't, I don't know what to do about. 
But I'm so thankful that he has all knowledge in heaven and earth. And I'm so glad he knows my address. Sometimes you wonder, but I've just come to give you a word today. God does know you by name. The word says that you're engraved in the palm of his hand. That he knows you. The very hair on your head is numbered. He knows the hair that fell out today. You know, I didn't really pay much attention. I don't look anymore. I don't look very closely. In fact, you know, in the mirror, you just quit looking with your glasses on. You just take, I'm telling you, I look like I've had a facelift. You do too. God is so good. Let's stand right now. What do you have to offer him today? What do you have to offer him today? We look at our lives and we, you know, we're battling to, you know, stay in and stay with the battle. And we, you know, you, you, you've got your aches and pains and you've got your situations. And life just keeps moving whether you move with it or not. And, and you're not ready to make that decision, but yet it's time to make that decision. There are so many uncertainties. But I am telling you today, you're in the house of the Lord. We've got the Word of God. We've got the Spirit of God. And today, what do we have to give Him? I feel like the lad with the lunch today. I just want to say now, this is what I have. It's not very much, but this is what I have. Or like Peter, who in the midst of the boat looks at the waves, and, but he's got his eyes on Jesus and says, you know what, with my eyes on Jesus, and he says, come, I'm going to risk it and step out of the boat. Wherever you are today, whatever you've got to offer, can we just offer it completely to him for a, a couple minutes right now? Lord Jesus, I thank you for your power. I thank you for your word, your word that's so much higher. Lord, I look at my life and I see the many times you've rescued me. I see the many times you've guided me. And Lord, there are lives in turmoil today. And even for those that maybe aren't in complete turmoil, there are so many things that we yet have to we have yet to solve and there's so many things that we are uncertain about today lord we once again tell you we want to do it your way i want my life to be completely in your hands i surrender myself today i surrender my goals i surrender my dreams i surrender my future i surrender my finances i surrender my physical body i surrender everything i surrender my emotions i surrender my relationships only you lord can fix some of the relationships in my life god when i've done my best my best is not ever enough lord when i've tried my best to financially put things together my best is never quite good enough lord i give it to you today because you have the answers for my life. Lord, direct me. Guide me. I need you. I am nothing without you. My life is nothing without you. Lord, my family is nothing without you. My future is nothing without you. That's it. I want you to just surrender it today. Whatever that is in your life. I know what it is for me today, but in your life, God, we need you today. I'm doing more than just a passing nod of respect on a Sunday morning and living the rest of the week the way I want to live. Today, I want want to center my life on you and I want to live out this week in your plan, in your will according to your direction in the name of Jesus and I want you to say I believe it I receive it in the name of Jesus and I want you to give him a shout hallelujah, thank you Jesus, thank you Jesus, God bless y'all be friendly and have you some coffee and snack and let's be back in here for worship at 1045 God bless you